are happy with 10% women in the room, I'm not. <laughs> and I also think it will not change so easily. Um, when we sit next year, there will be 30 and then there will be 50%. I'm talking about the engineer of the future is a woman. Did you know that every second child in this world lives in poverty? Do you know that every third child in this world doesn't have adequate shelter? Do you know that 70% of all the people in this world, the poorest people in the world, are women and their children? Women and their children hit hardest when poverty strikes. Unfortunately, there is a strong link with gender and poverty. If you want to have a deep influence on the world and how the world works, you must realize you will be helping mostly women and their children. Technology can help hit those hit hardest by poverty. Engineers, you guys, you can think of the technology breakthroughs. Oh, can I do that? Technology breakthroughs that help major issues in this world. How to get access to water for all, how to get food, shelter, education, healthcare to all. You can help shape a better world for the poorest people around. I believe that engineers are our best bet to solve these problems. I hope that we are getting close. I think that's why I'm here today. Brainport, the valley of the brightest people in the Netherlands, I'm told. You can help. You can really help to solve these problems. Isn't that an inspiring idea? Isn't that a great idea that you are capable of helping? Let me take you back a couple of years ago. I was sitting on the sofa, I think it was a Sunday, reading a magazine, I think it was Fast Company, and I read a very small article. It was not big, and it was about four Harvard engineers that, like some of you, wanted to have a deep influence on poverty in the world. And of the fact that 25% of all the kids in this world don't have access to electricity at their homes, they thought of a ball. A ball with an inductive coil in it, coil in it and movement on the, of the ball generates electricity. From 10 minutes of joyful play, yeah, you can take up three hours of portable energy with you to a home that doesn't have electricity. There's a small outlet on the ball, and you can plug that into the ball, for example, to a lamp, and you can have light, light in a home that doesn't have electricity. For example, to do your homework. It's pretty simple. Like most brilliant ideas, I guess. By the way, the four Harvard engineers happen to be all women. They are the inventors of the socket ball. And um, at the time I first found out about this, I worked a lot with the people from Philip Light Labs, the people that think about light each and every day. And I took the idea to them and I said, you know, please look at this, because I'm so, I'm so taken by this, you know. Can you please look at this? And is, you know, my question is, is this a difficult idea? You know, why did people think about this? And they said to me, Esther, looking at it, it's pretty straightforward. It has been thought of before many times. You know, it is not this, it's... And so I said, I said so why haven't it done before? You know, this can be a major breakthrough for many people. And they said, Esther, you have to realize you know, that, we, um, that it's very difficult for us to think of how can we produce a ball and bring that to the people that don't have even have money to pay for electricity and for us to have a decent profit margin. That's why it's never happened. While technology can help solve um, um, major issues in this world. We need to rethink our business models, as Herman just said before. We need to rethink how we, do, way to how we do things. And there's one other dominant issue that I think we need to look at. 
Technology seems to be the domain, exclusively the domain, of mostly males, at least here in the Valley. When I come here and help companies or I talk to companies, I see men, mostly men, almost exclusively men. And you know, I just took this, I, I, I took from the Brainport side some pictures, and I, I added to some important people here in the Valley to it, and I wanted to make sure that you saw that there are women. Yeah? And you know, and you maybe can help me, because when I, I couldn't see this, but I did not know if the two women are the same ones. <laughs> maybe you can see it from up there. I hope to see you in the break. Yeah. You know, this really worries me. It really worries me. You know? I wish I could join you. I wish I could be part. I wish I knew how to contribute, but I can't. You know? I think I was at the age of 14 quite a bright, inquisitive kid. But you know, my science teacher told me, Esther, I expect you to drop science and technology from your curriculum because you don't fit my criteria. His criteria were that you had to be a boy. Is the valley so male? Because women don't understand technology that well, like my science teacher thought. Is it because women don't, are not interested in technology? You know, it might sound very odd answers, but these answers I get when I speak to people here in the valley. They seem to be answers that people accept. And I'm not buying it. I can't buy this. Why is it that the minority, majority of the people that are currently studying at universities in Europe, 60% of them are women, going to 70% in the next 10 years, and a technology education seems to stay so male dominant. Why is it that you allow that the majority of the smartest kids in high schools are girls, and you allow them to become a minority here in the valley, in your universities, but also in your organizations? Why is it three times harder for a woman to climb the ranks in the academia here? Why is it that I see when I speak about this here, I see reluctance and submission, like, I can't help, I can't help it. Why? I believe that major breakthroughs will only happen in technology when you include others, when you start including the women. They will help you, and one of us is never as smart as all of us. And if you want to do great things, please make them a part of your, your, your business. So what can you do? How can you contribute? How much do you challenge yourself? What teams do you work in? How diverse and how inclusive are the teams that you work in, the projects that you work for? How do you challenge each other? Who will be the next person to be added to your teams? Will that be somebody that looks like you? Or will that be somebody that really can challenge you? Ask yourself these questions. I am somewhat taken by the idea that why haven't the smartest people of the Netherlands not figured this out? You know, why do we have to have in 2013 a session that has to do with this? Allow me to offer you one explanation. I think your brains are in the way of picking the best people. I think that you, you have to realize that the way how our brains work, that we, what we like picking the people that look like us most. What I know from this, I have from a woman named Mazrin Banachi. She's the social ethics professor from Harvard. And she has studied this subject for many, many years. And she says, you know, what we do is we favor those people that look like us most. And so we keep picking the same people over and over again in our teams, thinking that they are the best. We did a test in the Netherlands, and we tested 2,000 managers in the whole of the Netherlands. And the first question we asked them was, you know, do you think a man and a woman are as capable for taking leadership positions? You know, does it really matter gender? And 94% of the people said no. It doesn't matter. Let's just pick the best person. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. You know, let's pick the best person. But then we tested their implicit bias. 
You know, you can test that through some, some and, we, and we, can t we tested it. And then what came out was that 72% of the managers, both men and women, have a preference for male leadership. And 50% of these people have such a strong preference that they should not be allowed to pick anybody because they jump to conclusions. So what we think what we do, like we pick the best possible person, in reality we don't. We pick the people that looks most like us. And we run away from picking the people that can help us to really contribute and to really help to have beta breakthroughs. So women are not the problem. Women are the solution. Please invite the women in your organizations. You will benefit from it tremendously. 80% of all consumer purchase decisions are made by women. If you want to build, make better products, if you want to think of better ways, of, please invite the women in your universities, in your organizations, at the tables where the, the, power, the decisions of, are taken. And it will lead to better insights, better products, and more ideas. The reward you get is not more women at the table. That's not it. The reward you will get it would spark the dialogue where you will really get breakthroughs, new ventures, and new business models. And you will have a chance to really do what I think we all would like to do most, have breakthroughs to help those people that need it most, it will be women and their children. Let's go back to those four Harvard women. Yeah. They thought of this business model. You buy one ball and you pay for two. And they donate one ball to somebody who really needs it. I don't know if you ever heard of the soccer ball, but it's pretty famous in the US. And people, they've, you know, these women became celebrities. They've been invited at all kinds of television programs. And the funny thing was, the question they were asked most was, did you already get rich of this? Did you become rich of this idea? You know, have you become over rich overnight? And these women said, I don't think we get the question. The whole idea was to help those kids. The whole idea was to do something good with the knowledge that we had. If we wouldn't have got rich of it, if we would have got rich of it, something would have not have worked. It's, it was never our intention. I agree with Herman that the world is, change, is facing a paradigm shift. That these Harvard women, rethinking what they're doing and why they're doing it, are not alone. 93% of, of all consumers, I think I need a slide, oh, this is a... 93% um, um, of all consumers want to buy products from companies where they know that they do something to make this world a better place. It's not about big, bigger, biggest anymore. It's not about more, more, more anymore. It's about these new world companies. It's about getting, giving purpose to what we do. I think it's not anymore about advancing a few of us. It's, ab it's about advancing all of us. How can we make that work? It's not about patents to enrich one person. It's about advancing those that need it most. The engineer of the future can help build a better world. The engineer of the future is vital in building a better world. Please inv invite and include the women to make what you do even better. The engineer of the future is a woman. Thank you. Thank you.